and we're live. Welcome back Hi. to another episode of Professor and the Idiot. I'm Nick Wolfinger. I am Dalton Whitehead. And uh, glad we're all here. Uh, say something again, Dalton. Just... Hello, hello. Okay, great. Okay, we are indeed all here. Just wanted to make sure in this uncertain era. Uh, Should today... I say something? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> if you want. Uh, oh, no, I'll wait until... I, I wasn't sure if you wanted me to say that I'm here. Or... Oh, no. uh, all right. Uh, uh, let me introduce you. You deserve a proper introduction, Rod. Okay, so, sure. Let me just give you that. So, the person you hear talking is Roderick Graham, who goes by Rod. He's an assistant professor of sociology at Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia. And you're originally from Virginia, right? Uh, no, sir. I'm actually from oh. uh, South Carolina. Okay, near, yep. okay. Virginia adjacent, I guess. Yeah, oh, pretty okay. close. Okay. And... Uh, Rod received his PhD from the City University of New York in 2009. He's published a lot, including over 10 articles in peer-reviewed journals and a book entitled The Digital Practices of African Americans, which came out five years ago. He's also written a bunch of popular press stuff, newspaper op-eds. He also has a series of interviews on YouTube, which is where he and I first met. Today, he and I want to talk all three of us want to talk about an article that Rod recently published on Medium called Reflections of the ADOS Movement. Am I saying that right? I think so. Okay. <laughs> I think it's ADOS. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The ADOS Movement which stands for American Descendants of Slavery. Uh, it's a very well argued uh, case for reparations. The idea that America should compensate African Americans from injustices stemming from slavery, Jim Crow, the legal immigration of separate but equal uh, in the South, and many other many other things. Uh, the timing is excellent. Just last Friday, the New York Times columnist and ubiquitous NPR pundit David Brooks surprised a lot of people with mm -hmm. an article calling for reparations. And so uh, I feel like the timing is great. And Dalton, I really liked your piece. So. Want to say something about it, and then I'll let Dalton have the first crack. Uh, no, that's a good introduction. Um, appreciate that. Thank you very much. Oh shit! Am I on the spot? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I enjoy the article a lot. Uh, I feel like the the history that you uh, highlighted in it isn't talked about enough. Um, it it was very you know I, I've read all that stuff, learned about all that stuff in history classes and stuff, but it's always very humbling to reread and go over the history of our country and the hardships um, many people have faced. And it, it's something that needs to be refreshed all the time to keep in people's perspective of the world. And I, that's one of the biggest things I took away from this article is how, how well it was written. And just how humbling it is. Well, you know, um, so this kind of got started. I taught a class, which which is how the, how me and uh, Nick met, and the class was on racial inequality uh, writ large. So all groups and and so, but somehow in that class we ended up reading this article by Ta-Nehisi Coates, which is um, uh, quite famous at this point about reparations. And so I realized that, you know, it's not just about, so he was talking about slavery, and then he, he kind of jumped to some housing problems in, in 1950, 60s Chicago, I think. And so I said, you know, you know, it's not just about that. If you focus just on slavery, um, then people won't know that this has been a continuing problem. So I wanted to... to add in some other things to show that, look, you know, um, while it's not necessarily any individual person, just on a group level, um, black folks have been excluded from competing in, in markets from 1860 or so, well, actually before that, but, but even after uh, uh, emancipation, 
I guess it was 1865. I should know that. It is. Around, I think it's 1865. <laughs> we should all, all, every American <laughs> should know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know what's wrong with you, but I think that's it. That, uh, up until now, that there's always been some level of exclusion. And so what that does is it prevents the natural sorting of, of black folk. Because uh, all of them won't do well, but you don't know what they could have done because they were excluded from competing. So I wanted to... to uh, make that case from then until now. So, um, yeah, yeah. The thing about that piece, um, what I wanted to do is is make that 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 case. But also, one of the interesting things for me and why I like that movement is because it it really puts a circle around descendants of slavery, which I am. Um, so I teach on a college campus. Uh, and um, everyone who I'm around is really uh, invested in uh, in diversity. They see it as a as a good. Um, sometimes I'm wondering what they mean by that. Actually, that's another conversation. But 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 they 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 do see diversity as a good thing. But their understanding of diversity is different than mine. So for me, diversity is very instrumental and practical. It's like, okay, if you're in a geographic location where you've got, um, um, let's just say, 30% Native Americans, and you feel that 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 you know you need a diverse school to to deal with that population, then bringing in someone who's who's Asian doesn't do that. Or bringing in someone from Eastern Europe doesn't do, or bringing in someone who's black doesn't do that. Like diversity is very specific to the popular, or dealing with those problems is very specific to a particular population. So diversity doesn't doesn't do it. So I'm on this campus here, and um, everyone's like, well, you know, let, let's try to be diverse, and so they they do that, and they bring in uh, minorities, but the minorities don't deal with the ADOS population that's here. So you bring in a native, uh, not a native American. We don't have any, native, or very few. But you bring in a Southeast uh, Asian person, someone from India or Pakistan, and wonderful teachers, nothing wrong, but they're not going to do the things for the 40% ADOS population that's here. So the nice thing about that movement is that it really tries to draw a circle around that particular population of people. So. I would point out, to make a point, to say something you said in the article, for example, Barack Obama is not Eidos. He's from, he is not the descendants of American slaves because his, no, no, no. his father was African. His father's African and, um, yeah, I mean, what's the connection? So, so my, um, aside from my political views, which aren't always what I, I think people think they would imagine they'd be. It's kind of a <laughs> odd way of saying that I don't always vote Democrat. But, um, but aside from that, um, I, would, I would tell uh, my friends and family that, look, you know, I understand you, you, you see Barack Obama as, a, as the first black president. He's certainly the first president of color, but there is no connection between his history and yours or, or, or ours in that case when I'm talking to my family. So, I mean, just anything, cultural, uh, lineage, uh, uh, it's just, there's just no connection. That doesn't mean, however, that he's not a good president or wasn't a good president or wouldn't do, do things for people of color or black folk. It's just that, yes, there's a, there's a, there's a difference uh, that I think is, to me, is kind of clear. What, so... What is the, I'm trying to unpack some of what you said oh, in sure. terms of having a, someone who is of a similar background from you. So what is, at your university, for example, there are students who are African American and ADOS. What are the benefits of having other ADOS students there or faculty members? Well, you know what is weird? I, ha I, was, I was speaking with the, uh, this came up earlier today uh, because it, it was the same question, like why, you know, what, the, the question sounds like, you know, what would be the, the educational outcomes for having 
uh, Eidos faculty teaching Eidos students. And you know what? It's not clear. So, so I, I imagine in my head that what might happen is that those students uh, would invest more in school. They may decide to make um, education a, a, a more of a priority because they see someone like them. They may decide to go to graduate school. They may do better. I don't, I don't know. Um, there, there may be someone, uh, actually I'm sure that there's been some research on this, but I don't know that research. So it could be that um, I'm imagining a, a benefit that, that, that won't happen. I don't know, actually. I, That's a oh, good question. A role, <laughs> a role model benefit. It's yeah, well, well, yes, a role model benefit. But the thing is, I don't, I don't know what the research uh, would tell us. So theoretically, I think it matters. Yes, I think that if you see someone who's like you, who's a professor, or just a position of authority, then you may say, okay, you know what? I don't have to, you know, just get my degree and then go and um, make widgets for eight hours. Actually, they don't do that much anymore. So, punch keys for eight hours. Um, instead, you know, I, I think I could, I could do something where I'm the supervisor, I'm the manager, I'm the professor, I'm the doctor, I'm the lawyer. So that, that's possible. I can tell you my own personal experience. Um, so we have a, so my discipline is sociology, but I've branched off into cybercrime, and we have a, uh, we have a master's in social and a PhD in crim. And I can tell you that the, the, the black students that I have, the ADO students that I have, it seems like they do prefer to talk with me more than others. Well, it seems that way. Certainly it's the case that the two, the two black students that are in our master's program now, I'm their, I'm their dissertation advisors. Hmm. Or one, I'm a dissertation advisor, and the second, I'm like number two guy, but I do the stat stuff. And I feel like it's because they think they can come to me a little easier uh, than they could another student. And my hope is that one of those students, at least, will decide to become a professor. I don't know if my anecdotal experiences will uh, will play out uh, at a broad population level, but uh, maybe. What do you think, Dalton? I totally get, can see uh, how that would be a legitimate thing. There's a like a connectedness, or uh, you have you have roots, similar roots, so I. I totally am on board with what you're saying of being an example or a, an authority figure of somebody having an, a, an authority figure or an example um, to look up to of somebody that's similar I, I definitely see how that could be motivating or encouraging to strive for better things I see it both ways where certainly we need role models, people we can relate to, but my hope is also that in the process of going to school and or even just being out in the world and meeting different people, one would just become more comfortable over time in general interacting with people who are different than you. Was that the hope, Rob? Yeah, I, I think uh, for for students who are different, that's the default. Yeah. So someone who's um, so someone who's gay or lesbian, they're going to deal with people who are not gay or lesbian by default. And so so it's not the same thing, but I'm trying to make an analogy. So 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 that's already going to happen. Yeah. So what you want to do though is show that it's possible for someone like you to to do a certain type of thing. So yeah, so 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 um, so it's good to have someone who who's like you to show uh, what you can do going forward in life. There's something here about this though. So so um, I haven't met Dalton, but I'm going to I'm going to take a, a a stab and say that that he is European American, white. Oh no. Oh yeah. <laughs> My last so, name is, is Whitehead, so oh, really? <laughs> you, are, you, are, you are correct. Well, no, there's a famous author, Colson Whitehead, who's not, yeah. so I yeah. don't know. <laughs> he but, does not have pimples. I'm, I'm, 
Say again? He does not have any pimples. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so it, it, it's usually the case when I'm speaking with, um, with, with white people about this issue, which can be very sensitive. So I actually appreciate you guys allowing me to talk about this a little bit on your uh, podcast. But when I talk to people about this, um, I have to keep in mind that there's a there's a there's a disconnect that's very hard to bridge. So unless you are someone who constantly finds themselves in spaces where they're different, it's hard to know the impact of that difference. Now maybe you guys yeah. are different, right? and so you, you you see that, but um, it's often hard to do that. So like when a woman wants to talk about um, or I'm in like a panel discussion and someone brings up a uh, woman's issues about uh, how they're perceived in tech or something well you know I try to understand but I know that because I don't I haven't walked in their in their uh, moccasins uh, to be stereotypical there's their their uh, high heels or something um, I, I I don't know what 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 they go through so I have to be careful and so it's the same here. So I'm I'm going to try to do my best to, to talk about uh, these things, but uh, it's really difficult because without being without having the experience, a lot of it's lost. Let me push back a little there in a couple of ways. Sure. First, I think it's vital in a diverse society that we. It's my obligation as an American to make an effort to try hard to understand what it's like for different kinds of people, mm -hmm. to tolerate them, to accept that there are some things I won't understand, but it's really, as a, as a citizen, I feel it's my responsibility. Uh, the part where I run into trouble is then where if anyone tries to tell me I'm not allowed to talk about race because I'm white or I'm not allowed to talk about gender because I'm a man and so on, then I feel like uh, that's a recipe for a, a, div you know, a divided society that's, uh, you know, not, that's not open to conversation and an exchange of ideas. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I guess we're both uh, Heterodox Academy. <laughs> you are a part of Heterodox Academy, aren't yeah, you? Yeah. No, I, I, I totally agree with yeah. that. Uh, really, I, I do. For, for my end, though, it, it comes in a different way. So um, I'm not allowed. Actually, you fit into this. I'm not allowed as a sociology professor to point out that that black folk and other minorities have agency in the things that happen to them. So I have to take this view that oh you know society is always doing these these bad things you know they're 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 racist they're discriminatory they're the hell you the hell you don't you just did it Rod <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but I, but I feel you man I mean I get what you're saying yeah, I mean yeah. I, I I of course you should yeah. we should be able to talk I mean that that's a that's really important yeah. you know, I was just pointing out the fact that uh, uh, sometimes when I have these conversations yeah. Um, it, it can be hard for me, and maybe that's pointing out my own difficulties in communicating, but it, but it can be hard uh, to bridge that gap between a person who grew up in a world that's been primarily white and a person that's grown up in a world that's, that's primarily black. That's all. Hmm. But yes, yeah, so these conversations are, are very important in a democratic yeah. society. Did you feel like you grew up in a world that was mostly black, Rod? Absolutely, but I didn't fit in. <laughs> I didn't fit in. I was I was such an oddball. I, I tell my I tell my mom if I did fit in, I, I probably would not be here now. But I was just so so weird until I was like, well, you know, I don't I don't fit in with uh, this group, so let me just go off yeah. video games and read or something. Huh. How so about in you? an odd way, it yeah. caught. No, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was going to ask Dalton. Do you feel like you grew up in a world that was mostly white? Oh yeah, I grew up in Utah. <laughs> yeah, that's why I. Oh, I'm a... Can... oh go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, I, I tend to. No, go ahead. Tell me what you're going to say. Uh, when it, when the subject of race comes up, I'm always 
very hesitant to have any opinions or anything like that because I mean I I did grow up in an area where the the school is ninety five ninety percent white and I I didn't. You know, I, I didn't see a lot of, it's almost like I didn't see a lot of racism or discrimination just because it almost wasn't even possible because it was just primarily white. So when I hear people uh, talk about their experiences or uh, societal issues when it comes to race, I, I tend to stand back a little bit because it's I have very little experience <laughs> with <laughs> anything in that area of life so conversations like these I'm always I, I kind of take a backseat and just listen because it's hard for me to have an opinion I feel like growing up where I did huh I mean we should have opinions though well I mean well I want to have an I want to have an educated opinion yeah. and like and obviously yeah. I, I I'm willing to say my opinion if I have one, right. but yeah. I t sometimes I think like it's hard for me to even have a legitimate opinion. Huh. So uh, that makes must make me the most informed out of the three of us because I grew up in a very integrated environment. Uh, there were not most of the people. I'm older than both of you, so most of the people when I was growing up were either white. Or African American, and in the city I grew up with was about half and half. And I always had white friends and black friends. My parents had white friends and black friends. And now I, my next door neighbors are African American on one side and Chinese American on the other. So it's like my all of my experience has been in life has been of diversity. It even meant that I didn't even understand or come to understand that racism was a thing until probably I was in high school just because I I was I was sheltered in a way mm -hmm. so well you know what Dalton said is um, well, well first off I mean uh, that's kind of that's what I would That are, are not trying to cause any problems, you know. They just so they're gonna they're gonna give this response, and it's a good one. It's just unfortunate this idea that you shouldn't that you shouldn't talk about those things because you don't wanna you you're either uninformed or don't know enough, so you just kind of you know give an opinion if you have to, but otherwise don't give it give it don't say anything. That's good in a way because it, it speaks to your character, but it, but it's also bad because uh, like. Um, like Nick was saying, I mean, we need to we need to talk about these things. Um, you know, I had an experience. So one of the students that um, I work with is a gay black male, and so when we sit down and we talk, I wanna I wanna talk about race, but his his main identity, I think it it seems to be is about is is the fact that he's gay, and so he'll talk about these issues. <clears throat> about the things that he goes through and I don't have a clue and I don't even realize I don't have a clue until he says well no this is what's happening you know this yeah. kind of thing but the nice thing yeah. is we start from the assumption that we're not trying to cause any problems like we're just trying to get to understand yeah, to talk I think the sad thing is that um, we we don't start from that assumption that 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 hey we're just trying to get on here and like there's no big you know no one's trying to hurt anybody and that, that that's really unfortunate. I think that really God just approaching these interactions, like you know with um, in good faith, uh, yeah, works good faith, works yeah. wonders. And I'm sure you've learned some about what it's like to be gay from him. A little bit, not yeah. too much. Yeah. <laughs> I try, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah. But, and, and my point is, so, so I, I know that we're here to talk about race, but but I like to make those kind of analogies because it's not totally unique. Like like these i these um this idea of a of a numerical majority or a dominant majority 
sort of determining how how things are organized, and then there's a um, minority that then has to deal with how with, with with how things are organized, not in their favor, is not not entirely uh, different. I mean, it's, it's not entirely about race. It's about other things too. It's about gender. It's about religion. It's about uh, um, sexual differences. It's, so you know, I'm just trying to universalize things. It's about much. it's about money too. It's about how much money you have. I mean, that's, I mean, oh, that that's just a huge, I mean, I think social class differences are huge. And they determine, the, often determine the kinds of people we interact with, the kinds of, uh, the kind of concerns we have on a day-to-day -day basis. Oh, yeah, 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 I can see that, yeah. I, um, so I'll give you a huge compliment, Rod. And that okay. is, I read Tennessee Coates' article about the case for reparations, and I am not a huge fan of Coates. And the reason I'm not is, I just get from him despair. I get anger from him. Mm -hmm. I get, I get the idea that, that everything, every situation for him is racialized. And this, uh, all of this, I find discouraging uh, for any number of reasons, and it doesn't, it doesn't certainly doesn't accord with my a lot of my day-to-day -day interactions with people of other mm -hmm. races. Uh, so I find I find that part of Coates tr that part of Coates troubling. I don't know. Do you? Well, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's. Uh, I think I remember you putting that on Twitter or something. I don't, yes. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I guess so. I mean, he he, he he's it. Um, I, my own problems with Colts are maybe a lack of rigor maybe I don't know yeah. like like it's, it's not it's not necessarily so he does a good job of narrowing something yeah but life is pretty complicated man and um and so I understand he has to tell a story right and sometimes that's more important than the actual information underlying that story because you don't want you don't want your ears to get lost in the weeds but sometimes I feel like you know, it's not it's not all about um, the man, um, uh, you know, somehow trying to keep the black man down. It's not all about the world is so bad that, you know, you as a black yeah. child, I think that's his last the latest book that he yeah. did. You know, you as a black child will always be under suspicion by uh, police officers. And, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. I don't. That's just not how people are, and that's not how the world is. It's a very complicated okay. thing. I think we see eye to eye there. And I feel like if you approach the world and you say everything is racist and everyone is racist, that you're blinded to racism that actually happens and discrimination that actually happens. It's just unacceptable in a civilized nation and if you say it's everywhere it makes it harder to focus on when it does happen yeah you know I think you're right so so my own my own particular take on this yeah. is that so that's so 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 one of the one of the things he's making like a moral argument like this is this is bad yeah. <laughs> and yeah it is it is bad when this happens um, so, so Kate Coles is saying that it's always happening. You're saying that it, it may happen, you know. I mean, not that it may happen. Yeah, that it does. Yeah, it does happen, but not uh -huh. that it's always happening. It does yeah, happen. It's, not yeah. it's just a certain. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, so no. oh, I, I, I would even suggest. Oh no, sorry. Go ahead. Can I, sorry, can I be? My, it is pervasive, but it's not ubiquitous. Does that make sense? There's a lot. Yes. Of, there's yeah. a lot of it, but it's not every. You know, it's not every interaction between. A white person and a black person. 
it's not every it's not every it, there's a lot of it there's too much of it but it's not all of it does that does that sound about right to you yes yes okay. um and i and i i agree I, so i think that your understanding is closer to reality than coaches <laughs> but I, I i want to go yeah. i want to go even further actually yeah. I, I would I would suggest that whether or not it's um, a lot, a little, or or even none, as some conservatives conservatives might argue, yeah. um, it that, that that's beside the point. See, so so my my view of it is that it's not a moral. So there there's a kind of moral. When this happens, this is the sign of 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 evil or bad or or something malicious. And then the person may even be that way too. My idea is that look, this is just human behavior. Like, 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 stop putting morality into it. To me, if a person, as a child, grows up uh, in a certain context where they don't have interactions with racial others, and they take in from the media and other places um, that uh, that that black folk but also other groups too you know there, there's something negative about them that's enough so so those conditions will produce prejudgments and they'll produce uh, discriminatory behavior that's just going to happen and I don't think that's that's because the person who has these ideas and makes these actions or oh, and, and, and performs these actions are bad it's just just being human and so in, so and so in my view I, I take a kind of everyday racism type view where you know, the, my fa my coworkers who are, are in a race and also go out and be a little reluctant to sit beside the black dude on the bus and will, will not move into a black neighborhood even if there is some good investment opportunity. They're just not going to do it. Huh. But it's not because they're bad people. <laughs> it's just because they live in the United States in 2020 and um, – the stereotypes that are associated with blackness are are pretty bad, and so and so you want to avoid that. So I, I don't know if that makes it more it bleak does. or not. That, <laughs> it, that, I mean, I that I hate to hear that about your colleagues. It just hurts. It's not. Uh, Wait a minute! No, 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 no. Yeah. No, it does. <laughs> My it's, colleagues are great. Yeah, <laughs> it's still, just, though. I mean, it's, it's just. Yeah. That, I, no, I'm uh, saying that that's yeah. that's what everyone does. Yeah. So I have I have stereotypes about yeah. other people. Look, if if I so I don't live in New York anymore, but when I did, if I got on a if I got on a subway or train, and you're around people who are very different, I'm not gonna if if a, if a Japanese woman, if an elderly Japanese woman sits beside me, I'm not gonna start talking about you know the Mets and how I think their season is gonna go, hmm. because. I've assumed, and she could be a big Mets fan, and she can't wait to see what Syndergaard is going to do this year. But, but I, I don't expect that she's going to do that. Well, see, that's it. That's that's prejudice and that's discrimination. It's not because I'm a bad person or because I'm immoral. It's just that okay, I know Japanese. I think in my mind, I have some vague understanding. She looks Japanese. Oh. Japanese people aren't interested in in this, especially a, a female, elderly Japanese person. Right. So why bother? <laughs> but but then if a black person sits, sits beside me yeah. who's my age, I may think, okay, hey man, uh, what's going on with the mess this year? So so it's not it's not a again. You you took this like I'm sorry kind of thing. No, I don't think so. I think it's just just natural, you know, everyday experiences. No, but you would you would decide. Uh, it's still, yeah. It. Uh, I don't know if "I'm sorry" was the tone, but it's just. Uh, I. Yeah, I. Would just. No, it's a different way of thinking. I've yeah. never published anything on that, but it's just. The, yeah. It's just the way. I mean, pe people don't put on their seatbelts. So you have to. But it's not they're, they're not immoral. Right, you have right. To the law. I mean, I, mean, I will. Let, I mean, me, that's all, you know? let me <laughs> say that I do. I write the point that people who are racist, we shouldn't treat them as evil. We should treat them as misinformed. Oh well, no, 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 okay. no, no. Sorry, I was okay. Wrong. There are people yeah. who do believe that genetically, um, white folk 
actually it doesn't have to be uh it could be genetically some racial group is better than another racial group they are racist what i'm saying though yeah. is that not that people who adopt you know modern western societies understanding of liberal democracy and equality among men and women they they just simply have stereotypes about people and those oh, okay. don't go away because we've evolved to be you know it, uh, it, uh, maximizers and uh, mentally, so we're going to clump information together. That, that that's all. That's right, not about right. no, no, okay. no. Right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I, I hear. What, I hear what you're saying. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, so it's not. It's not racial stereotypes that are exercised uh, for in the for in wrongdoing or mistreatment but just no no one's gonna vote no i'm not saying that my colleagues are gonna vote for uh removing um black people to liberia or or something like that (laughs) no i'm just saying that just just you can't help it as a human being to develop stereotypes that's all yeah but to me that's a that's an avenue to 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 moving out of this morass because what happens is you can say okay fine you know that, that we all share this fault as human beings. Actually, it can be a benefit when you, you know, evolutionary psychologists say that we evolved this way. But but we but, but we share this fault, and so th- there's no reason to say, oh, you know what, you know, this organization has consistently not hired black folk or Asian folk, and so therefore this this is institute this is institutional racism or something like that. No, no, no. It's just that the fact that you know people want to hire people who they think they can get along with. And unfortunately, if if the the people who are already there doing the hiring are white, they're they're going to bend towards white people, not because they're caught trying to cause any problems. They just simply want to hire people they think they'd be friends with. Now that's stereotypical, that's prejudicial, but but that's just human behavior, hmm. you know. So so going back to that Ados thing, yeah. Uh, it, it, it's certainly the case that, that, well, thank that you there for keeping some... us on topic because we were we were <laughs> so go on <laughs> sorry but but that, that sort of bleeds into that no it's I'm, good I'm, no, I'm I... glad yeah, go on <laughs> yeah. that uh, most Americans just wanted to get on with their lives and so if they if if they decided look I don't want to move into this neighborhood um, that would certainly you know lower the over time collectively would lower the uh, values of homes in black neighborhoods or they decided you know I don't want to hire this black person I'm gonna hire this white person I think that for 95% of those decisions it had nothing to do with I'd say post 1965 I don't know about it before then, but but certainly in the in the modern era it had nothing to do with not liking black people it, it not really it was more about you know sort of a I want to hire people that I'm comfortable with, I'm going to be around, or, you know, they're playing on stereotypes, and, you know, so I, I think that's, so, so I think that has been the problem for black folk up until now, and so that's not something that one can deal with by simply saying nice things or, or uh, public service announcements or, you know, nice speeches or something. There, there has to be, there has to be real real action through the policy or economic level to deal with this natural human um, tendency. So I am of I am of really a couple of minds on the question of reparations. On Mm -hmm. the one hand I am totally convinced of the virtually unique i guess you also identify american indians as another group as another unique unique group but virtually unique discrimination and mistreatment certainly uh, uh, slavery and jim crow are unique Uh, uh, i wonder what are the what are the politics of doing it it seems like if the Democrats do it, they will lose a lot of white support and perhaps support from other ethnicities because people will say, great, they're helping the blacks. What do I get? Do you see that dynamic happening? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. Um, 
Well, so I think um, what may happen is that there may be some kind of broad-based um, working class policy in place, like to deal with wealth inequality. And the idea would be that by by, by focusing on working class and, and people in poverty, you will also tap into that into that ADOS group. I think that's what will happen. I, I don't think any viable um, politician will focus on ADOS in particular. There, there's just if 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 this was fifty percent of the population, yes. But the practical matter of it is that when you're fifteen percent of the population, and I don't know how much of the voting electorate, there, there, there's no way that uh, that that will be a policy that they'll um, make a part. As a serious candidate will make a part of their um, platform. Although well, some people have come yeah, out yeah. in reparations in some yeah. Ka yeah. Kamala Harris and Elizabeth Warren have both ta have both taken it on as, as an issue and support, so they support it. Ah, yeah, you're right. I wonder, so I haven't looked at the, the specifics of that. I just wonder if it's more like, so by rep reparations they are talking about uh, ADOS, but I, I, I just wonder if it's not going to be watered down or or just is it just rhetoric or is it will it be lumped into some other big policy i i, I can't imagine that, that would be something that someone would campaign on uh, but but you're right yeah um it would it would be very divisive and um if i was a if i was someone who was not a descendant of slaves i, I could see like why why do this you know i mean in in some very <laughs> Like I think people are very, they're irrationally rational, in that they they're going to they're going to choose things that they think are in their immediate interests, and so there's why would someone who is not going to get any kind of benefit from reparations or um, low cost uh, housing, um, no interest rate loans? There are other things that can be done. Why would they vote for them? Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. Yeah. Do you see that, Dalton? And d did I see that? No, no. I mean, do you see it that way? That it's just a a policy that won't be very appealing to Americans? Oh yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. We actually brought this up in a sociology class I took a couple of years ago, and this girl made the point. And as far as I could tell, the whole class pretty much seemed to agree. Of how can you take money from people who had nothing to do with those terrible things, and and I, and I understand that the reparations movement isn't just money, but just to simplify, um, how can you take money from people who had nothing to do with those things and give it to people who were not involved, uh, who didn't suffer through those terrible actions? I think that's how most people would view it is, you know, it's like that. And I think that the, the Jim Crow laws and stuff like that are uh, definitely a big part of this, but uh, the slavery aspect, I think most people would just say that happened so long ago, you know, why do we need to give our money, our t tax money or whatever to, go towards the descendants of that when it happened so long ago. And I understand it wasn't that long ago in the grand scheme of things, but I, I just feel like that's how most people would view it. What do you say to that, Rod? How would you, how do you respond to that criticism? Well, it makes sense to me. I mean, really, I mean, if, if you, <laughs> most, not most, yeah. all, <laughs> why folks uh, now don't, have nothing to do with uh, slavery and would detest the practice? Uh, why? Why? You know? Why would you do that? I actually want to look at it in a different way. Um, so, I, so, so I, I guess you know, the, the students in Dalton's class are being perfectly rational and, and correct. I would not want to give money to, to something, but but I, I think the the idea is that if this is about government doing something for a population. So uh, um, imagine that, so, so the example I gave in that article, and I like uh, this example, is that imagine a policy says, okay, we need to do more for our veterans. 
Um, our veterans uh, need, you know, a you know, more money put into the GI Bill or something. I don't know. Well, most people won't imagine that. Oh, you know, these these veterans are taking my hard-earned money, and and uh, you know, it's just not it's just not a part of the dialogue. Um, or we we imagine you know more money going to disabled or low-income students or something. And so, to me, when I think when I hear those arguments, I, I understand them, and I think the problem that people who are supporting reparations what what they have to deal with is to change that narrative so that it's not this notion that it's like this zero-sum game where you know people who have <clears throat> and worked hard for their money are taking their money and giving it to a group of have-nots, even if they're deserving. Uh, instead, it needs to be understood as a kind of policy that's dealing with a segment of the, po of the population. That's hard to do, but I think that's the only way to deal with that. I, what's the difference? I'm not sure I followed you there. Could you say that again? Well, I, I'm not sure if I said if, 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 so if a politician was running for office and he said that we need to invest more in our veterans, I'm not sure if the, if in fact, I don't think that the connotation would be, the understanding would be that, you know, oh, man, you know, I'm taking my money. I had nothing to do with the wars. I had nothing to do with any of this, and I have to give my money to these people, you know, who volunteered to, you know, to go off to Iraq or something. Right. Like, it, I, I'm not sure if that's the, that's how people would think. No, oh, I see what you're saying. You're right. Yeah. They wouldn't. Yeah, and so I think the, yeah. the, the onus is on people who are advocating for reparations to make the claim that look, it's not it's not about it's not about one person giving to a, another specific person. It's about the government it's about uh, our government, you know, advocating a policy to, to uh, assist a certain population and that that's enough. It's um a I could frame it even yeah. more broadly than you did. It's a social responsibility for the well-being of the country. For uh, even better, yeah. yeah for the, I would vote yeah, for you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm unelectable. <laughs> you couple, can't have guns in your Twitter profile. You can't. You can't. <laughs> yeah. Not in California. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in no. Calif I'm in California, and I have guns. Well, um, you wouldn't you wouldn't be elected to office with that profile picture. <laughs> That's my Facebook picture, actually. But um, oh yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think I think you bring up a good point, point. Um, because especially I don't know, uh, trying to convince uh, white voters to be on board with this, framing it in the way of saying like this isn't a punishment on you guys. You know, the the idea of reparations isn't you guys did something wrong and need to pay these people back you know don't don't twist it like that it's there's a population of uh, certain people that need help so let's help them yeah 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 there's a um oh no go ahead sorry Oh, I was I don't know if this is a good parallel but it just came to mind because I've read about it what all the former Soviet Union countries had to contend with after communism fell, when they had to somehow go on as individual countries, even though your neighbor on the hall, he was a secret police agent. The neighbor on the hall, your other neighbor, he was informing on you. How do you restore trust in a free country after living in a police state where you had everyone informing on everyone? when you had people committing real crimes. How do you do that? It, it was a real challenge that all those Czech, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, many other countries faced coming out of the Soviet Union. And so I was just, it just popped into my mind as a peril. How do you make an unha uh, a, a contentious and sometimes vicious past, how do you move past that for the for that health and well-being of the nation? Yeah, yeah, I can see that. I, I, I actually, um, I was listening to this audiobook. Um, I'm bringing this up because I, I think I used an example in that article, but it's a, I think it's a good one. Uh, it was called um, uh, the Last Boy. It was about Nicky Mantle's life, 
and it wasn't a straight autobiography. It's about this journalist who spent some time with Mickey Mantle. It turns out that he wasn't he wasn't an angel. Like he did a lot of bad things. But uh, but one of the things uh, that she talked about in that um, book was how he grew up in um, Oklahoma and how where he lived there was a lot of zinc and nickel mining. And at that time, uh, many miners were dying. Uh, premature deaths, including his father and grandfather, because they were working in the mines. And in the the uh, the catalysts, so I don't know the mine owners or something. They they knew that there were problems, um, and they they did very little to deal with it because of course they don't they don't want to pay more, they don't want to pay for insurance, all that kind of stuff. And so to me that that's something that really hurt the families going forward. In fact, I, I would imagine that if someone would. Uh, would track the lives okay. of people who, who couldn't make it to the Yankees. You'd find out that, that uh, they probably didn't do as well as their cohorts. And that might have been a direct uh, link or, or, or direct cause because uh, or, or direct effect of their parents dying early or working in those mines. I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Dr. But if that link was established, then you yeah. could say, look, this is a population that needed to be dealt with. Yeah. There's research, yeah. actually, that shows that people who grow up in areas near mines and super fun sites and high pollution suffer, suffer uh, and suffer su enduring consequences. And there's also studies that show that African Americans, among other uh, populations, are more at risk of growing up under those adverse environmental conditions. Yeah, oh, I yeah, mean, yeah. I'm, I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to generalize yeah. the idea that yeah. this is about you know dealing with certain policy. Yeah, See, but, that, uh, it's the same it's the same idea. Yeah. See, Don, that's why we need government. <laughs> nah. <laughs> Don is a libertarian. He doesn't. Uh... <laughs> All the see when when we talk about this type of subject, it's uh, you know, slavery was law of the land, a government policy, Jim Crow laws, government. See, it's the government's fault. Well, no, <laughs> oh, hold on, though. No. I mean, oh, it's... Just, see, no, no, no. I want to hear this. That's, that's All an right. interesting okay. thing. Okay, so tell me about that a little bit. What's uh. Say say more about that. Well, I mean, I feel like a lot of civil rights and uh, people's <laughs> okay. Well, okay. The theme of this podcast is I'm a libertarian, but I'm not very educated, so I say a lot of stuff just to dig into Nick because he loves the <laughs> government. But part, but, but, part, but part of me. Uh, does think of like man i feel like a lot of these problems came from government so let's just get the government out of the way hey yeah i think he has a, he has a point a little bit it's certainly the case that uh plantation owners leveraged the state to enforce uh slavery even to the point where when when uh, black folk wanted to escape, they got the uh, slave patrols to go. And play. No, I mean I can I can kind of see that a, right. a little bit. Yeah, segregation was a law. That's government law. <laughs> so it sounds yes. to me like the government's the root of all this. <laughs> <laughs> wow! They, they certainly funded the uh, trips to the African coast to uh, get the slaves. The Genius. You know, <laughs> Dalton, the Nazis, the government. Right, exactly. Yeah. That is the government. Well, they were, yeah. <laughs> Those people who put the red box DVDs back wrong in the machine and jam it, the government. No, uh, see, now you're going a little too far, Nick. <laughs> now you're trying to make me look stupid. No, I'm not. I'm just... I'm yeah, talking about uh, mass Mr. murder, Trump, enslavement. I think that's a good, good uh, point, actually. All right. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> before we bring this to an end, uh, okay. yes, uh, since I'll be, I'm going to be the government of this podcast, is there anything uh, you either of you guys want to add? Um, I, would, I would just like to ask, is, is there a, a video, other than your article, is there a, a politician or a, somebody who talks about reparations 
in the way that you would like them to be implemented. And I also was wondering of how long repar your version of reparations would last. You know, is this a program or uh, policies that would last for a, a decade, a hundred years, forever? You know, what is there? Is there an end goal with reparations in your mind? Oh, so um, so as far as the politician, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, and honestly, I haven't really paid attention. I, I'll pay more attention to to what politicians are saying. Um, I, I'm assuming you're meaning at the at the pres at the, the presidential candidates. I don't know. It, 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 I'll worry about that later. As far as the time frame, so in my mind, I'm imagining that uh, there are ways of identifying um, descendants of African slaves. Uh, so identifying Ados, and then you put some policy in place where you provide benefits. The benefits themselves. Will will be a one-time thing, but they could last for a while. So let's say I had a child. Well, depending on how the policy is in, I wouldn't have a child in long life. D depending on how the, <laughs> the policy would be put in place. Me neither. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, maybe my child will get some of those policies. The way that I understand it, it would be somewhat graduated. So my wife is Korean, so she wouldn't. So it might be that. Um, we wouldn't get the same, my child wouldn't get the same benefits as someone whose uh, mother and father are Eidos. That would be distributed then. And then um, at that point, that would be that would be the end, I think. So like, like, like once the policy is in place, it would be the, the people who are around now. It might be that they don't get that benefit until they're 19 or 20, so maybe a college degree. Um, scholarship or something, but uh, I think it would be more than one time thing. So, so one of the policies would be um, some kind of cash payment. I'm not in favor of that. I think it's a bad idea, but um, that's one of the things that people are talking about. But that would be a one time thing. I'm more in favor of something that would more approximate competition because it's not the case that all ADOs would have done well if the market was open for them. No, there would be people who would do very well, people who would do very poorly, just like another population. So instead of making it so that you just, you just give, you know, maybe make it so that it would be like, okay, you know, if you want to start this business, here is a no interest, or there will be a loan that will be backed by the government, so it would be no interest or low interest or something like that, or scholarships or investment in the communities that they're in, this, this, this type of thing. I, you're definitely hitting on something that Dalton and I have talked about before in this podcast is we're both capitalists and we both want to see we both want to see market competition and we both want to see all of our human capital being used yeah, and absolutely. so I'm to the left of Dalton and so I'm more willing to resort to innovations uh, to increase access to the market, but absolutely, we talked about this in terms of gender when we talked about a bunch of Title IX suits uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Title IX cases against many universities arguing that they've become anti-male, and talked about anti-male. Oh, yeah, there's a bunch of Title IX suits. That uh -huh. charge that universities now they're almost 60 percent female, yet they still have scholarships that are earmarked for just for women. They have women's study centers, women health centers, and oh yeah. But do they asking? We asked in the pot. We had the guy who's filed the Title IX suits on the podcast, and we asked if there's uh, we explored whether these were still needed or not. Mm -hmm. so, so anyhow, this is we're we're interested in market competition on this podcast, and we're definitely interested in equity. Hmm. Huh. Anything else you want to say, Dalton? Taxation is theft. <laughs> <laughs> Taxation makes me feel like an American citizen and pays for many important things. Yes, you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for, uh, or we wouldn't have this wonderful country. If it wasn't yeah. For, uh, 
Some wouldn't have this wonderful places. country if we didn't go to war over taxes either. <laughs> hey, Dalton, does it bum you out when you're driving on socialized roads and the nanny state of the traffic lights? Why not let the free market decide who gets to go first? The, have you seen how traffic works in other countries? A lot of times they don't have lights and they figure it out. <laughs> I don't need a I don't need a red symbol to tell me to stop. I know I should stop because there's other cars possibly intervening. So before you go, Rob, one question: Tell us one fun thing about you, or what a hobby, or something. Oh, uh, <laughs> I don't have any. Uh, I love baseball. I um, I'm waiting on the Dodgers season to start. I've been watching spring training games uh, on. MLB.tv, and I hope that they can get back to the World Series and win the damn thing. You're a Dodgers? I don't know if that's it, really interesting, but uh, yeah, you know, I'm a big Dodgers fan. Yeah. Even though they're from the West Coast and you're from the East? When I was a kid, um, I turned on the TV, and um, I never really watched baseball because I was a football and basketball guy. Yeah. And I saw this team that was not supposed to win first beat the Mets and then beat the A's. And they had a pitcher, or Hershiser, who was really oh, good. Oh, yeah. They had I remember a guy who hit, yeah. <laughs> who hit the home run on a bum leg. I was like, man, I love that team. And that, that that's how it started. And so I've been a Dodgers fan ever since. That's uh, awesome. Yeah, yeah. man. I, yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot for taking the time to talk to us, Rod. It was great. Yeah. I like talking about these things. So anytime. Okay, great. Uh Shit. Love to have you back at some point in the future. So thanks a lot. Appreciate your yeah. time. All right. Thank you Thank so you much. Guys. Thanks for having All me right. on. Thank you, Rod. All yeah. right. Take it easy. Mm -hmm. You know, you've been listening to the Professor and the Idiot. Thanks for listening. Blah, 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 blah. You've heard it all before. Okay. Quick. <laughs>